Um, this is a Peter Hornbeck at Cell Signaling Technology, and we're presenting a, a work in progress of our analyses uh, and uh, results of Clarissa Rikova's work on lung cancer cell lines. Um, and it's, it's sort of split, and as you might have noticed, we had a little bit of difficulty because it's split between multiple sites. Uh, Clarissa and I uh, and uh, Stephen um, are here at Cell Signaling Technology. Mark Grimes is going to be reporting from University of Montana, and Neil and Nicholas are going to be reporting from Avi's lab. Um, and I meant to say that Stephen Brinton's uh, analytical work is what Clarissa Lukova will be um, I'm talking about this afternoon. Hi, my name is Clarice Rikova, and I'm working at Cell Signaling Technology, uh, where we specialize in, in the profiling and, and trying to understand the signaling pathways in cancer. The uh, technology which we use was developed and um, published uh, from Cell Signaling Technology uh, in 2005, and we call it a PCM scan technology, where you can start with any sample. Uh, it could be the tumor, it could be the cell lines, where you do protein digestion and you end up with a number of the peptides. And after you ask him what the peptides would be of your interest, uh, in this example it's phosphotyrosine peptide, so we're using beads coated with the phosphotyrosine antibodies and trying to pull down the peptides, uh, phosphotyrosine peptides, and subjecting to the MSMS analysis. Over the, um, uh, the long period of time, it's about five years, we accumulated the number of cell lines and the tumor samples and the normal samples. And so what we're trying to do, we're trying to profile the cancer cell lines, tumors versus the normal tissue. And we're trying to look at the different PTM modifications and I'll uh, explain what I mean by that. And also be looking at the full practicum between this uh, um, uh, cell lines and normals and tumors and normals, trying to identify the deregulated pathways and the new disease drivers. And so the over last 10 years, we built this library of the tools and we call them motif antibody. And you can see the first one is phosphotyrosine antibody, which is well known, and we use it to identify all the tyrosine kinases and the substrates. In another section, uh, you can see that a different motif antibody from the AGC, AKT motif, MPK, and for the DNA damage, ATM, ATR. And you see number of the different um, antibodies, clones, which we uh, identify and which give us the best uh, and the deep mm -hmm. data set. Also, we're looking uh, now at the epigenetics, and we're looking at the acetylation, methylation, uh, lysine methylation, and arginine methylation. And we have number now, uh, different motif antibodies. We can look at mono uh, dietrimethylation. And also we can look at ubiquitination. So the technology now which um, we're using is, uh, we, because since we want to um, do the very highly quantitative, uh, generate like highly quantitative data, we're using the TMT labeling, we're using six plaques. And so we could use six different samples where we would, again, um, use the protein digestion. And after we label uh, peptides from um, every sample with a different TNT tag. And after we mix these six samples as one sample, and we can look and uh, uh, incubate now these peptides from the samples with the phosphotyrosine antibodies and uh, subject to MSMS -MS analysis. And after we can uh, take the supernet and now incubate with the beads coated with ATM, ATR, subject to mass spec analysis. So for every sample, we really get the all readout of uh, what is going on in the different spaces. And as the samples, we can use also the cell lines with the treatments and see what is happening during the drug treatment. We can also, um, as I present you today, we can also use the normal uh, channel where we would use normal lung and after we will profile different cell lines. And the same approach we using for the full proteome, because sometimes when we look highly, we see the highly phosphorylation, we don't know is it the protein level goes up or is it just the PTM uh, plays a role. Um, so we apply this technology to the, um, here is presented 35 lung cancer cell lines, and we compare it to the normal lung. And what we try to focus in the tyrosine kinase, serine kinase, acetylase, methylase, and just try to find what would be the regulated pathways and what the possible new disease drivers. 
And so the way how one way how uh, we look at the data, and that was um, from the Stephen uh, who is uh, here, and I, I hope he'll present soon uh, his uh, the way how he put together network. What I wanted to do is just to take the kinase which I found is very highly deregulated. It means that the um, ratio between the tumors and normals is very high. And try to link them based on his predicted network to the uh, methylase, acetylases, uh, diacetylases. And so by doing that, after you can now, uh, so if you have link between the kinase enzymes, now what we decided to look at the substrates which would link to this um, also from his um, uh, network. And so what we focus, we focus on substrate uh, which is methylated or acetylated highly gain tumor versus normals. And when I was going through the sites, I realized that many of the sites is actually not be all also highly ubiquitinated. Uh, so if you would think that in a tumor that site instead of being ubiquitinated, acetylated, methylated, in this case the protein will become stable and wouldn't get uh, degraded. So yeah, here's just a couple examples if you can just focus here on the EF2. You know, for example, here we see that um, the site uh, 239, we found it's really uh, acetylated, highly acetylated uh, in the cell lines versus normals, but it's also known to be ubiquitinated. In other, in other side, 272 and 275, we found all of them being highly acetylated. And um, uh, like as an, another example, that's another protein uh, where we see again, uh, like uh, K64 is uh, known to be ubiquitinated, but we found it's being uh, acetylated in tumors again. Uh, that could prevent this protein from the ubiquitination. So what we're trying for now is just trying to establish these networks where we could take the uh, activated the kinases, which we see being activated in tumors from uh, tyrosine serine treatment, and try to link them acetylation and methylation. Also, since um, this 25, 35 cell lines include non-small and a small cell lung cancer, we're trying to see can we identify the specific signature for the KRAS versus non-RAS or, or small cell lung cancer. And we could see this, you know, specific kinases on the uh, sites, on the specific sites, is actually highly phosphorescent related uh, uniquely in the small cell lung cancer. So we're trying to investigate and see what the could be possible the disease drivers. But how can we verify all this network? So what we decided to do, we decided to take the cell lines uh, RTK, driven by RTKs and use them to try to map these pathways. So we focus on the known drivers like EGFR, MAT, PDG, we also done for ALK. And so we're given a drug to all the cell lines and now we're looking what changes in the tyrosine kinase space, serine treatment, acetylase, again, methylases. And now we can start to build the pathways um, network, we will see that you will give an uh, inhibitor to the EGFR, but you will see how many uh, other uh, receptor tyrosine kinase get inhibited in the case of ALK and in the case of MET. And now we can also map, uh, um, map all the serine kinases, which could be also um, get downregulated by the uh, inhibitor. So ho we're hoping that this pathway, uh, which we're establishing by the treating cell lines, will have a help us to identify and see uh, how well we predict the pathways across the 35 cell lines. Thank you. Okay, so um, just to reiterate the goals, we wanted to look at uh, the covalent modifications in lung cancer cell lines, and we wanted to identify signaling pathways. And um, we're focusing on tracing the pathways to transcription factors with an eye towards linking to gene expression data eventually with the rest of the Lynx consortium. And I think the other modifications besides phosphorylation will be useful for that that Clarissa just talked about. And the ultimate goal is, of course, diagnostic markers and potentially new drug targets. And we're operating under the hypothesis that clusters, using a clustering technique called TSNE that I'll describe briefly, um, containing proteins that are known to interact with each other uh, from protein-protein interaction databases are likely to represent functional signaling pathways. And we hope to extend the pathways by looking at proteins that are commonly post-translationally modified together. So we want to extend what's known. And uh, what, uh, for mathematical considerations, we define each experiment as a different state in the system, and so any perturbation 
is a different cell line or a drug treatment or whatever. And um, to, to uh, get the most out of the data, we combine both the lung and the lung cell line data and the drug treated cell line data. And that's about 30,000 unique uh, peptides and about 7,500, 7,600 overlap between the two data sets. Um, the problem that we need to call in help for is we have holy data, and uh, that is that mass spectrometry has a low false positive rate, but a high false negative rate. In other words, the detector misses a lot of things. We should also acknowledge that the protein-protein interaction databases are biased towards those proteins best studied. So uh, it also contains false positives from high throughput um, and false negatives from things that haven't been studied. So the sort of conservative approach, not in a Republican way, but in a sort of biologically conservative uh, way, is to treat the data as, uh, that, are, that are missing as NA in R, um, and combining the lug and trug, the, the, the whole data set is about 78% NA, and that's about the same for um, each data set individually. <clears throat> The reason that we do that is because if we put zeros in there, the zeros uh, all correlate with each other. So we calculate the statistical relationships using pairwise complete observations, and we use Spearman dissimilarity and Euclid, Euclidean distance. And then we blast the, uh, the no relationships uh, out of consideration by making them large in dissimilarity. Um, and an alternative approach is a matrix factorization uh, method uh, or regularization that Neil Clark is going to talk about, and I think that looks promising as well. So we embed um, Euclidean distance or 1 minus the absolute value of Spearman correlation into a three-dimensional graph using TSNE, and then we look for clusters using uh, the things that are close to one another. And we, we embed uh, Spearman dis dissimilarity with uh, the absolute value of the correlation or just the correlation. And we combine Euclidean distance with Spearman. And, and uh, then we use uh, Lawrence van der Matten's TSNE technique to identify, uh, to make an embedding. And um, you can look up his website. This is a, a very good technique. So this is the clusters from that particular embedding in different clusters. And, and to make a long story short, we did a lot of evaluation, both internal and external, and the TSNA worked really well. And if you're interested, I won't talk about it, but you can uh, look up these articles and see how we evaluated things. So the bottom line is that the clustering identified uh, proteins that are known to want to interact with one another, and the clusters make sense. So here's a cluster that contains uh, inhibited uh, modifications including MET and several cytoskeletal proteins and so the implication is this is a metastatic pathway and this is the kind of cluster that Clarissa can uh, see using that uh, sort of ranking approach that she's talking about. So we're, we're also doing two new things. We're using a cluster filtered network and that is to show only edges among co-clustered nodes that could be a a protein-protein interaction edge, or we call it a co-cluster correlation network if we define correlation edges as being the absolute value of a certain value and show the correlation edges only among uh, sites that co-cluster in at least three embeddings. And let me illustrate with a little diagram. We can start with a protein-protein interaction network. That's the red edge here. And these are from various sources, string and gene mania, pathway commons, and uh, phosphocyte. And we use just real interactions, not text mining or co-expression. But the proteins are modified, and so all the little green balls here are the modifications. And the modifications correlate with each other, and using this correlation edge approach, we can construct a co-correlation, a co-cluster correlation network just among the modifications. And we have so then sort of two complementary networks. And if we wanted to focus on uh, 
the groups that are going to be interesting for cancer, we, we start with receptors, we look at kinases, and we look for links with transcription factors. And that gives us a way to trace pathways, and we can start with the receptors for a sort of top-down approach, or we could start with the transcription factors and look at the shortest path from one to the other, and then what, what kinases are connected in between, recognizing that kinases may be drivers as well as receptors or transcription factors. So I'm going to show you just one example. Here's one that uh, contains uh, the receptor tyrosine kinases, ALK and AXL. And if we look for the links between the most prominently phosphorylated transcription factors, PML, ERF, and this chromatin remodeling enzyme, BAS1A, um, what we can do is look at the pathways connecting those. And in fact, there's no protein-protein um, interactions that are known except for with ALK and this chromatin remodeling enzyme. But if we look at the uh, co-cluster correlation network, the yellow edges are spearman, uh, positive spearman correlation, and the blue ones are a negative uh, spearman correlation. Then we can see that uh, AXL modifications do correlate with um, these other things. So this chromatin remodeling enzyme, ERF and PML, correlate with ALK. And in fact, we have some links with this kinase in the middle, MEKK5, or MAP4K5. So in summary, we can extend what we think are real pathways uh, to, to include new potential interactions and it appears that ALK and AXL are, form a kind of collaborative relationship. They're often phosphorylated together, and in fact, they correlate with each other. So ALK is shown at the top here, correlating with these two phosphorylation sites on AXL. So there are many examples of these, and um, we, we have a, a lot more to go through, but I just have time to show you one here. So the, the, the bottom line is that we can use this cluster filtered approach to trace pathways and identify modifications associated with known pathways. And then we can extend the pathways, uh, for example, ALK and AXL uh, through this MEKK5 and the chromatin remodeling enzyme BAS1A and these two transcription factors. So that identifies a potential new pathway to be investigated. There's a lot more of these, and I don't have time to talk about all of them. So the challenges that we have ahead of us are creating a navigable rendering of data structure. I'm using R Cytoscape, R and Cytoscape and R Cytoscape in between, and Neil Clark is, is do, using another method, and um, I think it is a challenge to talk to one another um, and talk to Clarissa so that she can understand what, what we're doing and other people can uh, understand what we're doing. And then we have the problem of prioritizing new potential pathways. And Nick is going to talk about how to do that. I think he's got some really good ideas for looking at kinases based on their substrates. And then linking the different forms of data, I think um, Andrew uh, Rillard in uh, Avi's lab is working on that. And Peter is also working on that. And linking to the rest of the LINCS consortium with the um, transcription data, I think, is a, is a, a challenge that we that we should solve in the future. So we should acknowledge that the people who gave us the data worked really hard, Clarissa who did the experiments and analyzing the data, uh, Sean and Stephen and Peter is not a trivial thing. And uh, the Mount Sinai people are going to talk next. So that's enough for me. So I'm, I'm uh... I've been looking at some of the sort of the, I suppose the more technical details of the analysis of the data. I've been taking, as Max said, I've been taking a, a different but hopefully complementary approach to to, um, uh, to the data. Um, first, I started off um, considering, as Mark mentioned, the the whole equality of the data. So there are. Uh, there's a large fraction of, of missing values in the data. Here I'm, I'm illustrating this with a, a small sample. Um, 
I'm showing down the rows I have 31 uh, uh, cell lines and I've chosen just 100 of the post translational modifications here just so we can see uh, the structure and the data uh, and these red parts here are indicating missing values and all the, the colored parts are indicating the present values now um, so most kind of machine learning statistical learning uh, approaches um, really require that there are no missing values um, and so we, there are two approaches we could take here we can either use approaches that are that can just use the present values and avoid the missing values um, this is what um, Mark has done um, or, or we can uh, try to impute the missing values so I'm, I'm going to, and this is what I'm, I'm going to try and do. So I, essentially, what I'm doing is I'm trying to use the patterns present in the in the in the in the present data values to infer uh, the the missing values. Um, and the reason I think we can do this is because of um, so quite recent um, uh, advances uh, in uh, research into the, the the matrix completion problem. So this has been. Uh, uh, so I've approached in much worse uh, cases than this where there is much uh, higher proportion of, of missing um, uh, values um, so essentially what the problem is uh, the matrix completion problem is when we have a, typically a very large matrix which has n rows and p columns and a large proportion of the the values are missing and what we want, want to do is is fill in those missing values with um, with our best guess of what they, the, the true values are. Um, one example of this is, is the Netflix data, uh, where, uh, where the, the rows are, correspond to Netflix viewers, columns correspond to movies, and the elements of the matrix correspond to ratings. And Netflix are interested in this because they want to be able to recommend movies uh, uh, to viewers. Um, but in this case, about 99% of the values are missing. So, the, so this is a much worse, uh, much worse problem. Uh, um, so, here is the approach that I, I that I took. Um, what we what we essentially we try to do is we try to uh, phrase the problem uh, as shown here in this equation. Um, what we try to do is we we try to find the matrix Z, which is as close as possible. Well, to the to the data values that we have, uh, while also being as simple as possible, it, it has a, the, Z has a, a in in sort of in mathematical terms, it has a low rank, which means it has a low, a small, relatively small number of linearly independent uh, rows and columns. So essentially, what we're doing here is we find the simplest complete matrix that fits the data. Uh, and if you solve this problem, what you find is you what, what you're essentially doing is using the patterns that you can perceive in the data from the present values to fill in the missing values. And uh, this uh, this uh, solution works quite well. So here's what it looks like. This is the original data that I shown you earlier uh, on the top, and here is the inferred data on the bottom. So you can see we kind of there are no more missing values here, and we've made what we think are pretty good guesses uh, about of what the, the, the missing values are, and we can we can uh, estimate our error, and it seems to be quite small. So having done that, this kind of opens up a whole world of possibilities. Um, there is a whole world of statistical learning techniques that um, we can now use because we don't have missing values. Uh, the first one I chose to use was um, uh, to make a to make a graphical model based on a regularized regression of the data. So essentially what I'm trying to do is for every post-translational modification I try to infer its value in each cell line based on the values of all other post-translational modifications. And then those, those PTMs which are most useful in predicting the value are going to form uh, an edge in my network. And also, I'm, I'm using a, leg, a regularization penalty because what, what this is going to do is it gonna, it's going to help me not overfit the data. So I'm not going to use noise in the data or, or uh, random scatter in the data uh, to get a good fit. 
I'm going to find the, the most sort of uh, reproducible uh, signal. So the, the actual name of the algorithm that I use is the Meinhauser Bullmore Bullman uh, algorithm. And the result of this process is a, is a network of, of PTMs. So this is you know, similar to what uh, Mark uh, was talking about. Or this is, you know, I have a similar um, sort of output here. Uh, I'm, showing, I'm showing here just the minimum spanning tree as a kind of a visual aid. So uh, <clears throat> the next step is, is to evaluate these networks. I, I want to know. I've inferred these networks from the data. I want to know how good are these networks. So essentially, uh, what I've tried to do is uh, assess to the, the degree to which known pathways are recapitulated in my inferred network. Uh, and, and the more known pathways that are, are sort of are predicted by my, by my network, the more confident I am. In, in the quality of, of that network. So, uh, so what I've done is I've taken the networks from from Keg, uh, pathways from Keg, and then identified those proteins in my network and counted the number of edges. And then to assess whether the so that the larger the the number of edges between those proteins of a Keg pathway, um, the more com the, the, the the higher um, the more likely that pathway has been uh, predicted. Uh, so then I count, I, I count the, that number of links and I, and I compare it to a null distribution based on a random selection of the same number uh, of proteins. So this allows me to calculate a, a p-value. So I, 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 I can say whether a given keg pathway is present in my network to a statistically significant degree. So the idea here is to provide it, it, it. This should be an objective and quantitative measure of the the, the quality of the network. The more keg pathways I can recover so in a statistically significant way, the more confident I am in my network. So here I've kind of presented it like a bar graph because that's how I'm interpreting it. Um, I've shown you a list of for the for the for, for the analysis approach that I just described, which is here, this third column. This is a list of all the significantly um, uh, predicted keg pathways. So there are 43 of these. Um, and I tried some alternative approaches to infer in the network. Um, I tried using a, a correlation approach, so using a Pearson correlation on, on, the, on the present values, sort of ignoring the missing values. And I get, and I get just eight. And I tried various sort of uh, statistical uh, uh, bootstrapping corrections to this, and, and I get slight improvements. Um, so, as far as I can tell so far, in, in the approaches that I've taken, the approach that I've just described is is the is the is the best. Uh, just just for a sanity check, I randomized the data and repeated the the, the validation uh, metric, and I don't recover any keg pathways in that. In that uh, so, which is uh, just good to see. So here, uh, here are um, a selection of those 43 keg pathways and the induced subnetworks. So these are all the edges that are present in my inferred network that are also sort of so-called real edges in, in a keg pathway. Now with a view to um, kind of taking on this this uh, network approach a little further and, and possibly um, sort of extending pathways um, I, I considered um, a Steiner, the Steiner trees so the, the Steiner tree is um, is defined in terms of uh, a, a network and then a, a, and then a subset of the nodes in that network and what the Steiner tree gives you is the simplest possible subnetwork that connects those nodes. So, uh, and it's, so finding a, a, the algorithm to solve this problem is actually it's, it's quite difficult. Um, it's quite a difficult thing to do, but uh, it's possible to get a kind of approximations to the to the Steiner tree. So here is an example of a Steiner tree in in the networks uh, that I've inferred. Um, it's the Steiner tree induced by uh, proteins which are members of the notch signaling pathway. 
So those proteins that are members of this, of this pathway are highlighted as red. And this, this whole subnetwork is the simplest possible way to connect the, those red nodes, the members of the notch signaling pathway, using as few uh, edges as possible. The, the kind of blue-gray nodes are what are called Steiner nodes, and these are uh, uh, nodes that help us connect uh, the our seed nodes uh, in the simplest possible way. Uh, you know, one possible way to interpret these are candidates for extensions of the, the non notch signaling pathway, because these are post-translational modifications that help us relate uh, those uh, the, the proteins in the known uh, notch signaling pathway. This is just a, a close-up to help in case you couldn't see the uh, uh, in case you couldn't see the details. So, so that was one example, but we have these Steiner trees for all of these statistic statistically significantly um, recapitulated uh, keg pathways, and these could be subjected to uh, to further analysis. So everything I've said so far has, has been um, trying to find the best possible analysis approach, the, the, the approach that, you, that makes the best possible uh, use of the data, and then validating uh, those approach uh, those approaches. Uh, here I'm starting uh, to try to uh, on the path to doing actually something useful with the data. Uh, here I'm 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 making a cell line specific Steiner trees. So I'm using the, my inferred network and a, a list of seed nodes which are extreme nodes in each of the of the of the cell lines. So these are um, post-translational modifications that are either extremely kind of up or down uh, regulated compared to normal. Uh, and so what what this these Steiner trees could potentially um, uh, be interpreted and uh, and for uh, sort of a, to make bi biological inferences, uh, cell line specific biological inferences. Um, so, so that's my talk on uh, uh, finding the analysis uh, methods. I can, I think I can hand over to Nicholas now. Uh, hi, so um, I'm uh, Nick Fernandez from uh, Obvious Lab, and I'll be discussing a, an, another alternative method that I was using to analyze uh, a subset of this data, the phosphorylation subset of the data. So, again, um, our collaborators at Cell Signaling Technology uh, used uh, TMT to measure differential phosphorylation in 31 different non small cell lung cancer cell lines compared to non cancerous lung cells. And um, we also obtained uh, gene expression data for these uh, for 29 out of the 31 um, cell lines from the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia. And um, by comparison, this data from the CCLE is, has like no holes in it, no missing data. So that's one advantage. And um, so I use a slightly different approach, um, but my ultimate goal was to predict kinase activity in specific um, cell lines. So I used uh, these two different independent and complementary data sources to predict kinase activity in the cell lines using three different methods. The first method is uh, enrichment analysis using known kinase substrate interactions and, phosphor and phosphoproteomics data from CST. And the other two analyses uh, were, used, uh, were done using the gene expression data from CCLE. Uh, the first way we predicted kinases from gene expression was using a tool called expression to kinase. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, so we use expression to kinase, which is a method, an enrichment analysis method used to infer kinase activity uh, from gene expression analysis, or gene expression data, and I'll explain in more detail how that works. And uh, finally, we used uh, kinase perturbation signatures, uh, which is a method to predict kinase activity by comparing a cell line's gene expression signature to the kinase perturbation gene expression signature. So to start off, um, we, to predict kinase activity using um, phosphoproteomics data, we um, use uh, enrichment analysis. And effectively, we're operating under the assumption that increased phosphorylation of known kinase substrates is indicative of increased kinase activity and vice versa. So for instance, if we see increased phosphorylation of known EGFR substrates, this indicates EGFR likely has increased activity. And you can see a, a diagram here showing um, overlap between differentially regulated phosphocytes and known kinase substrates. 
and we use enrichment analysis to calculate significant overlap between these two and infer kinase activity. The uh, second method that we're using in parallel using uh, gene expression data is an expression to kinases, which uh, predicts kinase activity from gene expression in a few steps. So the first step is to start from your differentially expressed genes and um, calculate transcription, enrich transcription factors based on transcription factor target gene interactions. So this is similar to the enrichment analysis for kinases, but it's for transcription factors. Then this uh, set of enriched transcription factors is further connected using protein-protein uh, -protein interactions. And uh, this creates a transcription factor protein-protein interaction network. And finally, uh, kinase enrichment analysis is used to predict the kinases that are likely phosphorylating this network of transcription factor proteins and protein interactions. So this is an alternative way to predict kinases from an alternative data set. And uh, lastly, the last method we used was to predict um, kinase activity from gene expression signatures by comparing these signatures directly to kinase perturbation signatures obtained from the L1000 connectivity map and the gene expression omnibus. So for instance, if the gene expression signature of EGFR knockdown is anti-similar to the gene expression signature of a cell line, then EGFR may be active in the cell line. So now I'll go over some of these results. And um, so shown here are the enrichment analysis uh, results from the phosphoproteomics data. So I visualize it here in this um, web-based uh, heat map. So as the columns are the different cell lines and the rows are the enriched kinases, uh, each tile indicates whether the kinase is enriched, uh, significantly enriched based on up or down red or blue uh, differentially regulated phosphor phosphorylation sites. Um, and uh, some kinases are enriched based on both up and down sites. So what this allows you to do is see the overall signature of predicted kinase activity in these different cell lines and also identify potential new driver kinases. So I'll just go over a few examples of where our predictions agree with known, um, previously known data. So for instance, um, EGFR is known to be uh, have an activating mutation in the cell lines H1650, HCC827, and H1975. And our um, algorithm correctly predicts that EGFR is uh, active in these, um, yeah, it's predicted to be active in these three cell lines. Um, we also predict EGFR to be active in two other cell lines that where it's not already known to have an activating mutation, and several other cell lines in blue here are shown, are predicted to have downregulated EGFR. So we're um, making a lot of predictions, and some of the predictions are agreeing with known data. And um, if you click on a tile, you can bring up the phosphorylation sites that are um, behind this prediction, the differentially regulated fossil sites. Uh, also, um, ALK is uh, known to have an activating fusion with uh, EML4 in the cell lines H2228 and H3122. So, and also, so ALK, uh, we correctly predict that it's active in these two cell lines. We're, we know it's active, and those are the only two cell lines we predict, so it's, uh, it shows there's some precision. Um, uh, and also PDGFRA, we know we, uh, it has a gene amplification in 17, H1703, and we predict that it's, it's upregulated in H1703. Um, also, we have uh, certain kinases that are predicted to be active based on up and down regulated phosphorylation sites, like for instance, CDK2 and H1650. In so uh, in this cell line, you have these upregulated sites and downregulated sites that are known to be substrates of CDK2. So this could potentially show us like more nuanced behavior of the kinases in the cell lines. And they could be increasing phosphorylation of a subset of their substrates and decreasing phosphorylation of other subset. Um, okay, so so since we made um, kinase predictions uh, based on parallel sets of data, so, uh, data uh, from gene expression, we um, we can now compare our predictions from our phosphorylation data to the gene expression data in just a sort of broad uh, way. So what we see is that overall our um, kinases that we predict to be active in these cell lines um, show agreement that's uh, with the gene expression based predictions better than uh, what you would expect from random. So for instance, we see that of the kinases predicted to be active, 21% of these kinases are also predicted by expression to kinase versus only 15.9% uh, when you shuffle the kinases or random, randomly predict kinases. 
15.9% uh, of kinases were predicted by a gene expression omnibus, and that's more than by random significantly. Uh, and 10% um, of kinases were also predicted from the L1000 connectivity map. And uh, lastly, we see a, almost 2% of these kinases that are predicted to be up or down regulated are also uh, have a significantly increased or decreased expression in that cell line uh, relative to the other cell lines, which um, could explain why some of these kinases are increased, have increased or decreased activity because they could be differentially expressed. Uh, so just to go over a couple examples again where we see multiple pieces of evidence from the phosphorylation and gene expression level for uh, EGFR, uh, which is known to be a driver in HCC-827, we predict it based on phosphorylation data that it's active. We also um, predict that it's uh, active based on a kinase perturbation signature from the gene expression omnibus, and it's also highly expressed in this cell line. Uh, PDGFRA, similarly, is predicted from the phosphorylation data predicted from the gene expression omnibus signature and is also highly expressed. So this shows us that we're able to predict uh, known drivers from using different methods and using independent data. And uh, lastly, I just highlighted a few examples of some kinases with uh, four pieces of evidence that they're active in a particular cell line. So for instance, AKT1 is uh, predicted from phosphorylation, expression to kinases, the gene expression omnibus signature, and it's highly expressed. And um, oops, uh, similarly, GSK3 beta in HCC15 also has uh, uh, multiple pieces of evidence, and CDK4 in HCC827 has multiple pieces of evidence that show that it's active. So these could be potentially uh, new um, driver kinases or new important kinases in these particular cell lines or in different sets of cell lines. So in conclusion, we predict kinase activity from two independent data sources. There's agreement between these predictions, and uh, we also are able to identify driver kinases uh, for using multiple methods and predict potential new driver kinases using multiple pieces of evidence from multiple analysis methods. And we can further combine these results from um, these different methods and from the previous methods we discussed to infer the regulatory pathways in these different cell lines. And that's all. Thank you. So uh, may I ask a question in, in regarding this uh, missing data? So do, do you guys have any, any indication why the data is missing? So maybe if it's below the detection limit or things like that, would zeros actually work better than NAs? Um, Clarissa, do you, want, do you want to answer that? Are you still there or do you want me to? Yeah, yeah, I can answer. So this is the what really um, you dealing when you do the proteomics, because the mass spec it's like if it's absent, the data is missing. It doesn't mean it's not there. It just all depends on the mass spec what peptide being chosen to be sequenced. So this is what we have to live in the proteomics world, um, you know, compared to the genomics. So well, this got also got to do with the antibodies because. The pre, uh, they're purifying with antibodies. And, um, yes, uh, so you can take the same uh, lysate uh, five times and use the same antibodies and come down with the different mixture of peptides on each of those five experiments. Right. So um, I can chip in too. It's uh, part, partly both of those things. The mass spec detector is stochastic. And the, the TMT is an attempt to get around that problem so you can directly compare treatment to control. Because when you're taking a peak, when the mass spec takes a peak, it's taking a peak containing all of those mass uh, tags that are only identified on the MS2 or MS3. And so there, therefore you can get uh, treatment to control. It's sort of a workaround for the stochastic detection problem. But it's a significant problem with mass spectrometry in general. It's getting better, but it's um, the data are not zeros. So are you guys using any methods to look to see if, uh, for example, if there's a missing piece of data because it wasn't selected for fragmentation or the MS2, you can look in the MS1 and find the parent ion of those. And so when you're running large data sets, what you can do is go back and based upon basically the retention time and the, and the peak location in comparison to the rest of the peaks. And you can say that that peak actually exists, not because you, cause you selected it in maybe one out of ten runs, but that the parent ion does exist in the MS1. Are you doing any of those types of analyses? 
If you would be doing, uh, if you wouldn't be doing TMT labeling, uh, you could do that. But when you're running the samples at the different times, the different days, it's very hard. It has to be samples run next to each other, uh, you know, and, and it still would be a problem. But yes, you know, we have a special program which could deal with this. But again, that doesn't, um, it cannot be combined with the TMT. So we chose the TMT labeling. Uh, versus, you know, looking going back and looking at the mass one because we see we think the TMT labeling can give us better, uh, quanti quant you know, uh, more quantitative data, especially when you compare, you know, you have on one channel normal and for example you have on another channel tumors or like five cell lines, it gives you know much better um, data. When do you think you will be releasing this data set? The data sets are available to you know everybody from our uh, people who analyze this. I don't know how should it be released. Uh, the Fosca site or like, I don't know. People. Generally, they're released. Um, well, first of all, we put a lot of uh, data sets, many of which may be involved in uh, Clarissa's studies uh, in Faso site, uh, but they're not. Uh, ex very easily identified as <laughs> Clarissa's uh, data set. So the way we do it standardly is by when she releases a paper, uh, it'll come out as a coherent data set and we'll, we'll publish what is published in any paper uh, in FossoCite uh, with the caveat that we don't take all data that's published, we only take data that's of very high quality. So if a p-value is 0.75, we don't put it in site. It has to be 0.95 or better. That's one thing. And the second thing, what Clarissa said, is that it is available to the Lynx Consortium um, on, uh, I assume, on our uh, CST Lynx site. The data that's, only the data that's being used for these particular analyses, that is already available. But I don't think it's available for public, hopefully. It's hopefully available uh, to, to us, the links group, until something is published. Okay, thanks. I was just wondering if, you know, somebody was interested in... If they want to contact us, and I'll help them. Okay. Uh, I have a question for Nick. Um, so, is the phosphoproteomic prediction of kinase activity substantially better, then, than the uh, prediction from gene expression? Um, I'm not sure at this point. I mean, right now, my um, background knowledge of these kinases uh, is pretty limited in terms of, like, we know there's specific kinases that are meant to be active in certain cell lines. So from what I've looked at, we're picking up more of them with the phosphoproteomics and the gene expression, but there's still more that can be done and maybe better ways of benchmarking the activity than kind of picking and choosing a few cases. Okay. Thanks. I have a question, too. Has anything been done to address this um, issue which came up, I think, in Nature last week about the reproducibility of antibody-based assays? I, I, I can, I'll just comment. I don't know anything about, um, about wh what you're talking about. I haven't seen that paper, but in fact, when we take the same cell line and um, culture it, you know, on two different days, say by two different people and two different, or even by the same person, you know, s several months later, and then to do a phosphoproteomic analysis on it. We'll, we'll get m many common things, but many different things. And it, it is inherently um, stochastic, the way the mass spectrometry works right now. P partly it also is stochastic because um, even in the cell culture dish, cells that are crowded are different than cells that are isolated. Their signaling pathways, if you look at them in, in, on the individual cell level, are quite different from one another. Things for us who are analyzing the data is that, um, I, I said this before, each experiment represents mathematically a different state of the system, and that each cell, in fact, has a, it might have a different state, and so when you're pooling all those cells and picking up um, different pathways being activated, the, the only thing you can say for sure is that things that are activated in the same sample are representing a pathway in that sample. And so actually that's good for the clustering analysis because that tells you that things that are co-activated are likely to represent the same pathway. Mark, the, um, yeah, the Nature article, uh, these are monoclonals um, and they're highly 
characterized as cell, by cell signaling technology. So um, we believe and have great evidence that for the reproducibility of what we uh, what we produce. And, and plus, this article which I think you mentioned about the antibodies is mostly we're talking about using the antibody and looking by Western or by IHC. And they were thinking that, oh, you know, they're chasing one protein, but in the end they were like looking at the um, mucin 16. In our case, this motif antibody is really pulling down this peptide and must spec identify the sequence. So, and with the, you know, this peptide is assigned to the protein. And this is very highly, uh, you know, this is the best data, is, you know, as best, is best as you can get. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, guys. It looks like we are done with the questions. Uh, and the time is up. So thank you again, everybody. And uh, next webinar is scheduled two weeks from today.